so nobody had green beer last night? No? Everybody's here paying attention? Thanks for having me. Um, today, you know, if you've got questions that come up during um, the, the talk, uh, feel free to uh, shout them out. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll save time for the end, too. And, uh, but try to make this as interactive and not, not boring. <clears throat> Just want to give you uh, a background of myself and, uh, and then talk a little bit about the business. Um, I grew up in Washington State, um, about nine miles from the Idaho border. Uh, I grew up on a, a, a family farm. That's actually the family farm right here. Uh, 1,600 acres in an area called the Palouse, one of the most beautiful places in, in my mind uh, ever. And usually when I tell people I'm from out west, they say, oh yeah, well, what part of Pittsburgh? And I'm like, oh, well, a little bit farther than that. Um, so I graduated from Washington State uh, with a degree in uh, natural resources and biology. I thought I was going to be a farmer, quite frankly. Uh, that's what I thought that I was going to do. I've got, uh, you know, would have been fourth generation farmer, but have one of those issues where I've got an older brother, two older cousins, a dad, an uncle that are all on the farm, and I was the runt. So there was not any room for me on the farm. And so I graduated from school and thought, what am I going to do now? You know, my kind of my life path of what I, what I wanted to do, what I thought was going to uh, set as far as my career, everything that I had been taught, uh, you know, the, the strong work ethic growing up on a farm. How many, how many are from farm backgrounds or is, is everybody from Lancaster County or they understand, you know, the nice smells of farming and everything that you get this time of year? So I did what uh, I, I thought the best. I'd never really traveled. I'd never really seen the world. And so I got on the internet and I found a company that would give working visas to farm kids and you could uh, go overseas. And so my only criteria was I needed to go someplace where uh, they spoke English. And uh, so I found myself in Western Australia where I lived for two years. Um, and I grew up a lot. I grew up a, a ton. My, my second week down on the farm, it was just this huge farm in Muck and Budin in Western Australia near Perth. And uh, I was there, uh, my second week in, uh, my, my boss Graham came to me and said, hey, you ever sh uh, sheared a sheep before? I was like, no, but you know, I've seen sheep at the fair. And it was, it was shearing season, and so they've got 25,000 sheep. So I found myself in this shearing shed with eight kiwis. Do you know what kiwis are? Eight kiwis? They are usually Australians. They're like the roughest, meanest people around, hardworking. But it's like 120 degrees in the shearing shed. And there's all these sheep getting ready, coming in. And I'm thinking, uh, all right. So a good sheep shearer can shear about 300 in a day. You know how many I did? Six. <laughs> and I killed two of them. The first one and the third one. I actually screamed out, I've got a bleeder. It went right up there and it was terrible. But I guess the rule in the farm was uh, that if you kill something on the farm, you've got to eat it. So for 53 straight days, I had some form of sheep. So that's, that's my Australia story. So when I got back, um, I moved in with a, a friend from college and I moved to Boise, Idaho. And uh, Boise is beautiful if you guys ever have a chance to go to Boise. And uh, that's where I met, I met my, my future wife there, Molly. And uh, I was working at REI at the time. Anybody know what REI is? Yeah. I was a cashier at REI. And this cute girl comes in, and I chatted her up, sold her a pair of snow gloves, and uh, didn't know at that time that she was a, had a master's in structural engineering and was uh, a, designing radioactive waste containment for Yucca Mountain. So, you know that term out 
kicking your coverage or marrying up, I'm definitely the example of, <laughs> of that. So, you know, if you've got a cashier job, be nice to everybody. So in, in 2000, uh, I moved to, uh, to Lancaster uh, to work for Mike Brubaker. Anybody hear of Mike Brubaker before? Mike Brubaker for the, is just a retired senator, uh, PA State Senate. Uh, he did, uh, at the time when I moved out, he had a agricultural consulting group um, in Ephrata. And uh, <laughs> a small town where I grew up next to was, was called Euphrata, spelled exactly the same as Ephrata. So when I moved out here, I was like, yeah, I'm working in Euphrata, Lancaster. And everyone was like, you are not from around here. Um, Brubaker Consulting was uh, an ag consulting group, basically crop scouts that would go out and far uh, to farms, visit with farmers, take a look at their crops, give them recommendations, fertilizer recommendations. But they also had this um, permitting uh, section because you read about in the paper, what is, what is some of the things that happens within farms and cities within Pennsylvania and Maryland and New York? We have really strict environmental regulations. We have really strict environmental regulations because of the Chesapeake Bay. And at that time, there was a lot of new regulations that were coming in that were being put down on farms. And uh, it was kind of this new beginning for farms. So I came out to work for Mike. Um, Molly and I got married. We had bought a house, started this new job. She started a job. And I think it was 11 months later, Brubaker Consulting filed for Chapter 11. So I was like, you know, here, here we are in the middle of nowhere. We don't have really any family around, no family around. Um, and in the middle of Lancaster, so Molly had a good job. And there was another guy that I worked with at Brubaker Consulting named George Hazard. <laughs> Should have known to go into business with a guy like George Hazard. But we started uh, Red Barn Consulting, and we started it out of our basement. George and his wife, Colleen, uh, he had married up too. His wife was a registered nurse, and so she had a good job, had insurance. And we just took a chance. Uh, we took a chance on starting a business up um, out of our uh, two-bedroom brick rancher. Um, so I'll talk a little bit. We started a, a, then a sister company in 2006 that uh, um, called Red Barn Trading. Uh, and then in 2009, uh, we went through a, a buyout with the Hazards where Molly and I um, decided that the, the path of the business was, was such that we wanted to kind of take it uh, within a different direction. It was really hard to be running uh, two offices, two branch offices, a lot of duplication of effort, um, kind of a lot of uh, uh, confusion there. And so we went through, we went through a, uh, a buyout. Um, we didn't have a buy-sell agreement in place. You know, we were just hey, it's great, we're going to start up a business and, you know, get an attorney, put articles of incorporation together. But we didn't, you know, we were really naive when we went into business. And probably for the good thing. You know, if we knew all of the stuff that it, it takes now, you know, we, I wouldn't be talking to you today. Um, so there's my personal life. That's, my, that's what I look like when I got married. 27. I'm 42, by the way. Uh, there's my boys. Uh, they are twins two years apart, I like to say. Oliver's eight and Gabe is six. So one of the best things, though, in personal life is how many people think it's a good idea to start a business with your wife? What do you think? <laughs> See any potential pitfalls there? How about talking about work all day long? And never really shutting it off especially when you're working out of your basement. You know, there's, there's things there that it, to do over again, best business partner in the world, best life partner in the world, but probably the thing that has kept us together are those two little guys because it gives us something else to talk about. So it is that life-work balance that is so, so important. Okay, so what does Red Barn Consulting really do? Uh, there's... 16 employees. Um, we do nutrient management planning. You know what that is a fancy term for? 
A farmer's got manure, and he's got to spread it on the ground. You smell it in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, and so there's different regulations about how that farmer can do that. We've also really, uh, our main vehicle within the consulting business uh, of our, our, our cash driver is the engineering, is civil site uh, engineering. And so we represent farms at township meetings, we represent them uh, at the state, uh, and we kind of do that, that uh, all of that permitting. Um, so we want to be that one-stop shop. We want that farmer to have one person to yell at. And that's, that's really worked well for us is to uh, develop a company that doesn't have to depend on others outside of the company or outside of your shell uh, to be able to deliver those services to, to your clients. Um, we Probably 70% of our market is within three hours of Lancaster. And uh, put a lot of miles on the car. I'm on, I'm on the road uh, a, a really good bit. Um, uh, we do have a job in Kauai. We're uh, permitting a 2,000 cow dairy in, in Kauai. So those are fun trips to go out there. Um, but, but New York and Maryland and Virginia too. So we do just you know really permitting for farms. And when you think about a business model that works, in my mind, <laughs> you find something that a person has to do and you take away that pain of having to do that task. And you just stay within your core competency and you do that really well. And that's, that's what we think that we uh, do at, at, at Red Barn. We don't get into any kind of commercial uh, construction. We don't get into any kind of residential or anything like that. We just strictly um, stay within agriculture. We probably only have one other major competitor. They're in Ephrata. They are the remnants of what was Brubaker Consulting. So all of those guys that are now our, our, our competition were guys that I used to share a cubicle with. And it's friendly competition. And one thing that you learn is that you never, ever, ever burn a bridge. Ever. Because you never know when something is going to come back. And that is just so important with all of your communications, whether it's in class here or later on in business, you just never burn a bridge because it always boomerangs back. It, it really does. So what is our business model? Well, you know, usually in slides or anything like that, what does red designate? Red's bad. Usually, right? So this is the Chesapeake Bay drainage way. Here's New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, a little bit of Delaware, some of West Virginia. Nitrogen loads to the Chesapeake Bay destroys the bay. Nitrogen and phosphorus. We have this high delivery ratio. Why is Lancaster red? What makes Lancaster red? Anybody know? In nitrogen getting to the bay? Who knows what nitrogen is? essential for crop growth, but I put it on your, on your lawns to make the, the, you don't have lawns yet, uh, to make your, your lawns grow. So what's, what's going on in Lancaster? Why is it so high? Why does Red Barn exist? Yeah? It's uh, dairy waste. It's dairy waste, it's hog waste, it's chicken waste. It's all of that stuff that gets applied to fields. What happens when it rains? Runs off, goes into the stream. So why is Harrisburg red? Anybody know why Harrisburg is red? Harrisburg has what's called a combined sewer stormwater system. You know what that means? You can't segregate rainwater from what you flush. That means every time the city of Harrisburg gets over an inch and a half of rain, all of it goes into the Susquehanna. All of it. So nitrogen, phosphorus, all of that stuff, because the, it's an old enough city. You can see here's Scranton. Here's all of these large cities up and down the Susquehanna River that the solution to pollution, dilution, right? Think about that one. So that's, that's, that's how they made their infrastructure, and it's old infrastructure. 
So here we are, we've got this big heavy lift because what do we have? We have EPA and DEP, so Environmental Protection Agency, out of Washington, D.C., delegated authority to um, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, in Harrisburg, four different regions, and they come up with the laws that come down, same laws that apply to um, sewers, municipalities apply to agriculture. And they've said by 2025, the bay is going to be clean. We're going to put all these measures in so that we can clean up the bay. And they have these sets of milestones that they've set. So we've got ones in 2017, you know, that we're reporting to make sure that we're cleaning up the bay. We're not going to meet any of those goals. But they're coming down with a hammer. I don't know if you read uh, last summer EPA and they're Black SUVs came up and visited 25 Amish farms in the Watson Run watershed down in southern Lancaster County, asking them where their paperwork was. You know, and Ezekiel Stoltzfus is like, I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, you know. So we are we are far away. But what it means is that, you know, companies like Red Barn who are delivering these services, um, we've got a choice to make. Do we grow? Do we meet that demand? Do we do more work? Or do we just stay focused in on, on what we do really well now? I mean, and that's a question that you've got to think about when, when you're making these type of business decisions. I did want to fall back just to, um, so this is in Texas. This is us two years in business. And we received a, a request for proposal from the city of Waco that said, we have 26 dairy farms that we believe are polluting the Waco watershed. Will you come down and investigate this? And they didn't want to hire a, a Texas engineering firm. They wanted to hire somebody from outside that didn't have any, any ties. So Molly and I packed up the Durango, drove 26 hours straight. Molly talks, says it's her 26 hour nap. Um, and, and, and we show up there and we're down there for three weeks. So, do you know what that, do you know what this is? So there's, there's about 15,000 cows up there. Yeah, so that's a lagoon. That's where all of the cow shit goes. Right in there. About 17 acres worth. Our job was to measure the sludge accumulation on the bottom of the lagoon. So you think about, you start a business, ah, oh, everything's great, but this is the kind of work that you actually do. We went in, when we kind of learned about all the stuff that we had to do, so there's me with a pole, you can see, and, and, and right there, here's, here's true love, you can see Molly right there pulling me around, and I'm in the boat. Um, uh, third day down there, we went to uh, Stephenville, Texas, the uh, awesome place. Uh, Rodeo Hall of Fame is there. Anyway, uh, we went to a, uh, a, a pet shop because I thought, I need to buy a bird or something like that. Have you ever heard like a, going to the coal mine and taking a, a, a parakeet with you? Uh, parakeet dies, then you get out of the coal mine. So we went and bought a parakeet and so I could take it out on the boat with me and make sure that if you know if the bird knocked over Molly you better start reeling me in but I didn't have the heart to tell the woman behind the counter what we were doing so I ended up buying you know like a beak sharpener and two months worth of food and this really nice cage and everything and um, little Pete made it about six hours uh, but we didn't go, we didn't go back and get another one um, so, uh, but that really set us up well in business. I mean, that really set us up as, as far as getting our name out there, uh, working really hard. And when you work really hard within, like, the dairy industry, you, you kind of get recognized. And it's, yeah, so I like to say I'm the rock star of the dairy industry, which really isn't, doesn't mean too much in this room, but it's uh, pretty cool, the ag consulting field. Uh, this is a, a thousand cow dairy that we designed uh, within, within Lancaster County. But what I want to show you is... We've got intensive agriculture and suburbia running into each other in Pennsylvania. And why do we have 
so much agriculture in Lancaster. I know it's historical and there's older farms, but can anybody that is studying business tell me why in Lancaster County, Chester County, and York County, let's lump them all together, why there's so much intensive agriculture? Any ideas? It's very rich land. Very rich land. Lancaster County is the number one dry land producing soil in the United States. Excellent. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. Yep. Productive land. Yeah. They have a certain amount of land reserved for farming. They do. They do. They've got an awesome farmland preservation program. It's very robust. Lots of family farms. You know, seven, eight generation farms. It's, it, it is incredible. That's good. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, we're really close to major cities. Boom. Right there. Say it again. We're really close to major cities. What are we close to? D.C., Baltimore, New York City, Philadelphia. Other places in the United States can raise the same amount of turkeys, the same amount of beef, the same amount of pigs, but they, where do they get eaten alive? Trucking costs, transportation costs. Lancaster's proximity to the marketplace will keep the dairies here. So what we've got to figure out is this urban suburban interface because agriculture is not going anywhere and neither is this. Here yeah, we got a 925 home subdivision, 70,000 chickens in these two barns right here and a thousand dairy cows right here. So what does this guy do? You know what he does every spring? He has an ice cream social and invites everybody over here to look at the little cows. It's all about that good neighbor relations. He's figured out they're not going away, but he's figured out a way how they can, they can you know, live together because he's out spreading manure spring, summer, and fall and uh, doesn't receive any complaints anymore. A little bit of ice cream goes a long way. So one of the things that we also are involved in is environmental uh, site remediation. What, what's wrong with picture one? Is that legal? Is it legal to have cows in, your, in the stream? It is. It is. But your herd is healthier when, it's, when you've got them fenced out and, and you've you know, replaced this riparian corridor. This is actually the same picture. You can see the farmhouse here. It's the same. And so in order to get that cleaner Chesapeake Bay, we're going to have to do more activities like this. <laughs> but in Pennsylvania, we have a communication problem. I was, I was in Philadelphia driving back on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, came in. <laughs> this is a postcard of Pennsylvania with cows in the stream. You know, hopefully it's more about this beautiful covered bridge in the back, but you know, we, we've got a long way to go of just retraining ourselves and our farmers and what we think about environmental compliance. All right, so I just want to shift gears a, a little bit, and it's, and it's talking about an opportunity. And so remember what I was talking about with the city of Harrisburg and how they have a permit, basically, that allows them to discharge nitrogen and phosphorus into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So one way that they can meet that limit that has been put on them is that they could put in a capital upgrade. They could upgrade that plant. Capital upgrades are expensive. When you do a capital upgrade, who bears the brunt of a, of a municipality putting in infrastructure? Who pays for it? Taxpayers. Taxpayers, exactly. So nobody wants their sewer bill to go up. So but they have these new environmental compliance. So are you guys, have you learned about cap and trade at all within any business classes, cap and trade? The idea is that for somebody has to basically buy their way from an environmental problem that they have. They can put in that capital upgrade, spread that tax base around, or they could purchase an offset from somebody else that is then offsetting what they're doing. 
So that's the that's the kind of the cap and trade. Anybody hear about the Kyoto Protocol? It's kind of the national uh, or, or international carbon trading system. It's really the, the way, the economic way in order to drive down costs but still get uh, to your environmental solution. So a credit in Pennsylvania is a pound of nitrogen or a pound of phosphorus is one credit. So in the back of these permits, they say you can discharge this many pounds of nitrogen or this many pounds of phosphorus. Well, when we were reading this regulation and they were going to put in a trading program, we thought we're, as Red Barn, we're really well positioned within the business with our farmers for our farmers to do a little bit more and sell those credits. So they meet a baseline compliance. They do a little bit more. Maybe they put in that grass buffer strip. Maybe they plant trees. Maybe they don't apply manure within 100 feet of the, of the stream. All of these things, these best management practices can be done. We can then monetize that, aggregate those credits together, and sell them to uh, waste treatment plants that have a permit. So what again in business? Somebody has a need, and you take away the pain. It's, it's really simple. And so that's what we've been doing since about 2006, is, is uh, packaging uh, these bundling credits together and selling it to waste treatment plants at, at the end of the year. And so our farmers actually get paid by us, by their consultant, which they, they like, because they're usually used to just um, paying us for, for consulting. But what it also allowed us to do is that we kind of became our own bank. Um, Red Barn Trading was able to then lend money to Red Barn Consulting. So this is where we had first started off uh, in business uh, out of our two-bedroom brick rancher. We then moved to Lancaster City onto Liberty Street and probably illegally ran a business out of there because we were zoned <coughs> residential and there wasn't any parking. But there's my sweet Durango at the time. And then we uh, moved to the Farm and Home Center. Anybody know where the Farm and Home Center is? Probably not. We were in the basement. It was the original bomb shelter for Mannheim Township. So we were in there for three years and didn't have any windows, but it was a good time. And now we're out on uh, Yellow Goose Road. We've been out on Yellow Goose Road for, for three years. So I just want to share briefly uh, historic financials. Um, this, we were bumping along in business. Uh, 2008 is when we had gone through the, uh, the buyout uh, of our existing or our business partners at that time. And uh, so we, we, we felt, you know, pretty good um, when, you know, a, a, a good rise in, in, in net income. Um, what do you think happens here? This is, you know, you go through these growth and you buy a building. You, you, you make major investments that have a huge effect on, on cash flow. And so thinking about how to budget, how to, um, you know, forecast how that is all, all going to work out is, is extremely in, important. What, what's, what's interesting to me is that when you start pulling apart financial numbers, who's, who likes financial numbers? Who, you guys, that's what you want to do, right? I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible. I'm one of those 30,000 foot thinkers that, you know, can't, can't dig down into the numbers, but it is so essential to have somebody that understands those things and can get into the numbers and forecast ahead. I mean, that's, it's incredible. If you're not good at it, you got to surround yourself with people that are. But one of the things when you're looking to be a good employee within, who's graduating 
are you, what year are you guys? So, so we got some we got some time. But the interesting part when you think about business and hiring, having more staff doesn't just create more revenue. Having more staff. So people want to be as lean and mean and efficient with their staffing because you don't ultimately, as the business owner, don't essentially make more money by having more staff. We're, we're really at this crossroads that, that I want to have discussion about and get your input or your thoughts on that because we're kind of at this tipping point as far as, as, as a company goes um, of where are we going? We're talking about this demand that we can see, this environmental demand and, and staffing up for that. Uh, and if that's something that we're actually, actually going to do. So all small business owners, I think, go through this. Um, when I'm a member of, at the High Center, it's, it's been tremendous just listening to people that have been through the things that, you know, I stress out about now. But I, I call it my, my, my small business denial. You know, where is it where we are really hitting that sweet spot as a business? There's that work-life balance that I talked about. And, and, and when am I going to stop feeling, you know, I've been doing this 16 years. I always, I've got this thing in my mind where I kind of feel like I'm still playing business, that I'm not really, you know, that when, when is that going to stop? When am I going to feel like, what I do is, is the right decision because the stuff, and it sounds so cliche, and I can't believe I'm up in front of people talking about it, but most of the things, most of the decisions, most of what I've done in business that has been the things that have helped out in the long runs is, is stuff that I totally missed the ball on the first time, that I, that I, that I made the wrong decision. But it's learning from those mistakes uh, it, to be able to carry on. So we're about 16 people right now. We have 16 employees. Everybody within there, within the company, has billable goals. You guys know about billable goals? You taught, have you been taught about billable goals? What is a billable goal within consulting? Does anybody know what a billable goal is? Anybody? Oh boy. You'll learn about what a billable goal is. A billable goal is what you will be given that the number of hours that you need to be billing to a client. It's something that attorneys do, accountants do, consultants do. That's how we get paid. And so employees will have a number of hours within a week or within a month that that company needs them to be billable. That that company needs them to be making money for the company. And so we're at 16 people. I don't have any mid-level managers. So you're looking at the HR department. You know, my wife, the, the civil structural engineer, the professional engineer, is the accountant. You know, you've got to wear all of these really different hats. But the bigger that we get, what are we going to have to hire? Middle management, right? Scares me to death. I don't know if it scares me because I'm a control freak and I don't you know, trust anybody with my business, or that I just am in denial of getting too big. Um, that kind of entrepreneurial spirit, they don't always make the best managers. You know, that 30,000 foot vision, you know, doesn't always mean that you have a successful business. You need people in their boots on the ground grinding away at that business. So that's a little bit of something that I want to talk about or, or how you guys are equipping yourself with the skills within college to then be really marketable later on. Because nobody ever told me, you know, I was a biology nerd. You know, nobody ever said that you're going to go out and, and, and run a business. You kind of fall into it, and then you surround yourself with people that are a lot smarter than you. At least that's what I've, that's what I've done. 
So I do want to take the chance and, and say thank you for the opportunity to talk with you guys. I want to hear about the kind of stuff that, that, that you are, that you really like about your classes, what you're hoping to get out of your business degree, and you know, what, are the, what are the things that you're doing beyond just the classroom work that you think is going to be really marketable for you to an employer? Are, those, are they those, those activities? You know, I feel like a lot of the things that I learned in college, the most valuable things are how to get along with people. You know, how to work within a small group, within a small team. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that those are the type of things that, that you guys are getting out of it. So I, I'm not going to get up here and just yell at you anymore or anything like that. I'd like to have that kind of discussion. So if you were putting on your business hat, and you said, OK, Peter, I've got a proposal of how you are going to take your business to the, to the next level. What kinds of things would you, would you propose? What kind of things would you think that Red Barn would need in order to grow? Or is it OK not to grow? You know, is it, is it OK to stay the same and have a niche business? Does growth mean, yeah? Can you talk a little more about like how are you like how much work do you have on a daily basis? Like, so how realistic it is for you to grow without overwhelming? Sure. So right now, if the phone stopped ringing, we have two years worth of backlog of work to do, and. <coughs> The projections of the new regulations and what that is going to do to agriculture, there's 33,000 farms in Pennsylvania right now. Only 1,500 of them are regulated. With the new regulations, all 33,000 of those would be under that new form of regulation. So the, the nugget is out there. I mean, if, if you guys want to be successful in business, start Blue Barn. You know, and, and do exactly what we're doing. I mean, it's, and, and I, I, don't, I don't want to sound, uh, the, oh, we're so great, we're doing a lot. We, we fell into it. Um, but you see an opportunity. So the opportunity is, I'm not, I'm not worried about environmental regulations going away. I mean, I guess if Trump gets in there, anything can happen. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, so, so let's say that. So given that scenario, the opportunity is endless. But in consulting, what are you limited by? If you have billable goals, what are you, what are you limited by? Yeah? The size of your company, so how realistic it is for you. That's right. That's, that's one of those things. But what do you, if, if, you are, if you're charging your time by the hour, what's your, may, your, your limiting factor? Oops. Yeah? There are only so many hours in a day. There's only 24 hours in a day. And you only have so many people at your company that you can for X many hours in a day. Exactly. That's exactly right. There's only 24 hours in the day. And a lot of people only want to work about six of those. You know, so that's, that is the, there, there's the limit. It, the capacity within consulting with any of those type of, of businesses is that there's just, an, it has to do with hours within the day. So do you staff up for that? Do you get more people to do more of that work? That's, that's, that's the big question. Because are you learning about overhead? So you bring in middle management, right? You bring in those middle management, HR, bring accounting in-house. You do all that, which is a benefit for the employees, takes away a lot of the headache. But what do they not have? What do, what do those middle manager, you, managers usually not have? Billable goals. Because their job is to be managing the people that are generating the revenue. So now you have this overhead. You, you, you're bringing in more staff that needs a retirement, needs to be paid, needs health care, needs a vehicle, and needs a computer. And so when you think about it in terms of a, of a business owner and a employee, Whatever that person's salary is, take it times two. And that's what the business is actually paying that person in, in a year in benefits and, and uh, 
keeping the heat on and keeping the lights on. So when you're thinking about those type of jobs and what you want to do, just know that the employer is thinking of it about a 2 or 2.5 factor on, on just what that, what that salary is. Yeah, what else? Yes? What role does technology currently play in your business and how could you see that sort of competing with human capital? It's, it's a great question. We are so dependent on, uh, we run all of our, who knows what AutoCAD is? So we, we, we do all of our work, all of our engineering work within AutoCAD. We've just moved up to Civil 3D and so everybody's running Civil 3D AutoCAD. It has made us so much more efficient. It has. It's $6,000 a license per year. You know, so there's a price of efficiency. We've just put in some new management time tracking uh, customer CRM software so that we can track all these things more efficient. So I'm really looking at needing to have somebody run that piece just for our company. You know, be that person that is just making us more efficient. Uh, so if, if you're on the internet tonight, look at Autotask, A-U-T-O-T-A-S-K. Uh, it's something that a lot of businesses are now purchasing for their, for their own business to, um, to make them more efficient. So technology is one of those places for sure. I, I, I think that that's, we'd be silly to, to not invest in that kind of capital, so that's great. What else? Yeah. So, like, if you, I know how you were talking about, like, how the cow dung and all pollutes the wire sometimes. So I was wondering that if you had the resources and the advancement, would you go to somewhere, like, near Venice? Because I know Venice, all the sewage water goes into the rivers. Sure. And, all, and my distant relatives used to be migrant farmers moving from farm to farm to farm. Yeah. So I don't know if, like, if you had the resources and the money, would you decide to go worldwide and do, go somewhere like that? If I would go to Venice, I wouldn't come back to Lancaster, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you, uh, I, thinking of those things at a global perspective is, is fascinating. It, and it is fascinating to think about um, all of the different issues that different countries have. W once again, uh, in, in my mind, being valuable is knowing your region so well. It would be hard to go and duplicate Red Barn someplace else without knowing that culture, you know? I think 15, 16 years ago, it was Euphreda Lancaster. You know, and, and that's, so to be able to embed yourself within the culture in which you're living and working is, is really important. So it's a hard to replicate that business model, but it is fascinating to see how other countries are, are meeting that demand, for sure. What else? Yeah. This might be a little bit more of a technical question, but when you first started the business, how did you set up your costing structure? Like, how did you know what to charge for this and, like, how to allocate this cost to that? Because it can be very, very complicated. You're so right. We had no idea. No clue. We knew what our billable rates were at our old job <laughs> that went under. So we thought we probably need to be making a little bit more, <laughs> charging a little bit more than they were, uh, is, is like the starting point. And, but that is, that is an important thing, is that it's really hard to think about charging somebody because you're a consultant. You know, charging somebody because you know something a little bit more than what they do about it. Um, and so that, that is, we're constantly battling that, whether it was day one that we opened up the business or, uh, you know, tomorrow, uh, that, that we're looking at our forecasting. So what we do within a job, somebody calls up and they say, I'd like to put up a new 60,000 head chicken barn. And we say, great. What township are you in? What county are you in? And we take that township ordinance and we read it, can you even put chicken barns here? We then write them a proposal that says, these are all of the steps that are going to take in order to put those chicken houses up. And it's going to take about six months because of the review process. So any of our work then goes off to a review agency. They mark it up, give it back. Uh, we do that at the township level, at the county level, and at the state level. So I'm getting to your question. 
So we have within that proposal an estimate at, in the back that basically says we're going to be able to do all this for $24,000. So how do we figure out that $24,000? How do we figure out that end mark? How would you go about it if you think, yeah? How much, it's gonna, how much you're going to have to pay to have the higher ups review it? There's, there's, there's costs associated with, with permits for sure. So that needs to be calculated in there. What else? What would be, what it would be Red Barn's cost? Yep. How much time it's going to take? So that $24,000, you need to be starting to divide that by the hourly rate of the people doing the work and the compensation for them. So there's, you start kind of backing into these numbers. You take that, that end goal of wanting to get paid X amount and then you're dividing it up by the number of hours that it's going to take for you to do that task. So you win some and you lose some. What do, what do you do when you are a manager, a business manager, and you're coming close to the end of your estimate, but the job's not done? What would you do? What's that? Right. Did you hear what he said? Change order. Call up Farmer Joe and be like, yeah, I was way off. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take more. You know what he usually says? Not my problem. You know, I signed a contract with you. It was a not to exceed contract. Who knows what a not to exceed contract is? Yes. Think about it. Not to exceed contract. Basically, you can't charge them more than what it says on the contract. Correct. It can be great for cash flow because if you are super efficient at the job and you can do that job for $16,000 and you are billing out $24,000, that's great. But if you stumble along the way and it takes you $30,000 to get that job done, and, and, and it's hard to think about it because $30,000, it's, it's time. That's the accumulation of time. That's, that's what it is. And so that, that job costing is, is super important. We've, we've gotten better at it. I wish that, that, uh, that we were even um, smarter uh, about how, how we're doing that. But it's, it's about that efficiency. That's, that's really important. Yep, what else? So who thinks I should go out and hire more people to meet the demand? Yep, no, I'm serious. I mean, I'm. I mean, not just for people that you know want jobs, but I mean, you want you you want this engine to keep going. You want you want to be able to satisfy. Yep. Before you go and make a permanent change, would it be possible that you could put in like a pilot project? So, like on one job, maybe try to have more people as like a temporary thing, just to see how it goes. For sure. Yep. One of the things that I do want to talk about is is marketability within. Pretty much Red Barn hires interns. That's what a lot of companies do. We hire interns. Because what do you do before you buy a new car or a used car? Test it. Test drive it. And that's, I mean, that sounds you know, harsh, but the amount of internships that you guys can set yourself up for, it, it, I, would, I would do that. You know? Make sure that you are getting internships, that you, that you are getting your name out there. What's the number one thing that I do? Is my fly in zip? No? OK. <laughs> Is, uh, what's the number one thing that I do when I get a resume? Anybody know what I do when, as soon as I get a resume from somebody? Check for spelling errors. Nope. Yeah. I do call references, but what's the first thing that I do when I get it? Yep. Check to see if you've done any internships. I'll look at that for sure. It's going to affect every single one of you. If there's one thing that you hear from me today, just this is my profound moment. What do, what do I do? I get that resume. It's got their first, last name, where they're from. What am I going to do? Yes. 
going to look them up on Facebook. You bet. What are they doing? Be so careful with what you post. We had a guy come in, you know, he was, had pictures of him beer bonging with his buddies and stuff like that, which is great, fun. I was a frat guy when I was in college. Thank God there wasn't Facebook. But I brought him in just to tell him, hey man, you're not going to get a job. Because reality is, social media has made our lives really great and interactions, but it is a porthole into your life. And any smart person that's going to be hiring you is going to be checking that out. For sure. So be careful what you put out there. It's uh <laughs> 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 <laughs>